Welcome to the Bold Lounge Podcast. My name is Lee Burgess, and I will be your host. If you're anything like me, you love hearing inspiring stories of people who have gone on bold journeys and made a positive impact in the world. This podcast is all about those kinds of stories. Every week, we'll hear from someone who has taken a leap or embarked on an extraordinary journey. In addition to hearing their stories, we'll also learn about their bold growth mindset that they use to make things happen. Whether they face challenges or doubts along the way, they persisted and ultimately achieved their goals. These impactful stories will leave you feeling motivated and inspired to pursue your own bold journey. I believe everyone has a bold story waiting to be freed. Tune in and get ready to be inspired. Welcome to the Bold Lounge. Today, I have Liz Elting. She is the founder and CEO of the Elizabeth Elting Foundation. She's also an entrepreneur, business leader, linguophile, philanthropist, feminist, and mother. And she is the author of the upcoming book, Dream Big and Win, Translating Passion into Purpose and Creating a Billion Dollar Business. Welcome, Liz. Thanks so much, Lee. It's wonderful to be here. I'm so excited to have you and and to jump into kind of your bold journey and your bold story. And we're going to start with the first question, which is what is your definition of bold? Well, thank you. I love that question, Lee. And I feel that bold is different for different people. It can mean a lot of different things. But I think in general, it means going and doing what your gut tells you to do, what you feel is important and meaningful to you and not worrying about what other people say. They may say, and often they do say, don't do it. It doesn't make sense. It's not going to work out. You're not going to be successful. Do it anyway. Follow your gut, follow your intuition, and don't worry about others. Take the risk. Often there's a risk involved. Take that risk and do it because if you don't, You took a bigger risk by doing nothing at all. Yeah. So there's risk in inaction, right? That's something that's just flashing to me right now as you say that. So we often think about, oh, if I do this, if I make that move, if I spend that money or not spend that money, there's a risk. But we often don't think about what's the risk of not doing it. And so I think that's really important in your definition. Yes, I think that's so true. I mean, it's taking a risk when others wouldn't. They may take the safe way. They may need the stability, Mm -hmm. but, you know, as the saying goes, fortune favors the bold. Yeah. And if you really want to live your dream, accomplish your dream, dream big and win, you're going to need to take some risk. Yeah. And as you say, there's a risk in inaction because you're never going to do anything completely interesting or extraordinary if you just play it safe. So being bold is a wonderful thing. Yeah. So when's the first time based on your definition that you remember being bold or becomes like one of your primary examples of boldness? Sure. I definitely took some risks in my life and I did some different things, whether it was when I went to Caracas, Venezuela, after graduating from college to work in an all Venezuelan company. And it was dangerous. And I did it anyway. And it was such a dream. But the the big thing in my life that I usually talk about was when I became an entrepreneur. Okay. And that was shortly after I graduated from college. I came, I went to Venezuela, I came back to the US and worked at a translation company, another translation company for three years, learned about the industry, loved the industry, but thought it could be done better. So went back to school and got my MBA from NYU. And I actually had an interesting stint very short, interesting stint in a financial job. It was working in the proprietary trading division of a French bank, where I quickly learned that industry and that culture was not for me. So that was my aha moment with what I went through. And I thought, I loved the translation industry. Yes, I know I have my MBA. I know I just, I, along with my family, really, my parents paid for that. But my heart is not in this job. I didn't like the industry. I definitely didn't like the culture of the company. And I thought I loved the translation industry. And while I was there, I thought it could be done better. And I thought, this is my moment. I have to do it. And the reason it was such a risk is, you know, as I said, I had my education. I had no connections. I had no clients. I had no money. I was in an NYU business school dorm room and I just went for it. And people said, well, you really should be at a big company. I mean, you need that security. 
or you're not going to make any money, or you really want to create another translation company. There were 10,000 translation companies out there at the time. But I said, yes, this is my moment. I want to do it. And I took that risk. And that's why, as we've talked about, risk taking is so important. And through that risk, I was able to accomplish my dreams. Yeah. So you were able to have your, what I call Eureka moment. Yes. I think, and I know I can do this. And it's not just a hope or, you know, a wish. I believe it and I'm going to act on it again. And and I think one of the important things in your book, which everyone should read is the power of the verb, right? Action. And you are taking action like left and right there. So you, you one, I do think your trip to Venezuela is probably a moment or just the travel. I mean, you know, five languages, right? You speak five languages yourself, but in the sense that there's a love of language. And then they're also one of the factoids I remember from your book is when you actually travel abroad, you actually are, are, you have a, a mental leg up on other people because of the way and what it does to your brain. And so that to me, from a mindset perspective, was an interesting factoid in the book with throughout the book, there's like little facts and quotes and things like that, that really draw you in to apply the things that you're talking about in your big and and bold world that you have created. But I think that moment kind of led to you being able to start your business. And one of the things you said was you had no clients, you had no connections and no money. People would say, well... How had how'd you do it? Where did you start? What what's kind of the next bold move once you decide I don't want to work in finance? I have this feeling that I'm meant to do something different. I'm gonna to listen to my gut, my intuition, and I'm gonna start my own company. And some people think I'm crazy or I'm not using what I just went to school for or whatever it may be. Kind of what is like that move that you make when all those logical things that are coming through, like no clients, no connections, no money. And I actually didn't go to school for this particularly. What does that look like? Yes, you're absolutely right. I love how you summarized all that. That is exactly what happened. And I thought, okay, well, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. And what I did was I basically did what I had always done in my life, which was I set goals with deadlines and I held myself to them. And I think that is so important for all of us. And I think, you know, we, we all say things like, oh, I want to create this, or I want to build a, a world changing app, or I want to make a lot of money. But the way to get there is goals with deadlines. Mm-hmm. It's, it's discipline. It's coming up with a plan in your mind on what you need to do to accomplish your goal or your goals and not letting yourself off the hook. So in my case, to get going out of that, that NYU business school dorm room, it was sending out 300 letters a day and making 300 phone calls and not letting the day pass without doing those things. And even within a sitting, making myself make 50 phone calls before I got up and and got a cup of coffee and so on. So it's really sticking to the plan and being very tough on yourself in order to accomplish it. Because I think now there's so many distractions in the world. Back in 1992, when I started, there weren't as many. I mean, there was always family, there was always friends. And I did need to, you know, cut down on all that for an extended period of time. But now there are even more distractions with technology and social media and everything. And it's just kind of focusing. It's being all in, being addicted, being obsessive. I mean, this is to create something big. I I think people can do something more balanced. They can have a more balanced life if that's not the goal. But for me, with what I wanted to do at the time, it was all about being all in, being goal oriented and staying committed until the end. Yeah. So I think, I think listeners can listen to those words and think, oh, it's not good to be obsessive. It's not good to be addicted. But actually what you're saying is you're obsessive and you're addicted to your success. You're dedicated to your goals. You're dedicated to doing the work to get the results. One of your quotes from your book, which I really, really like, and it's in the first chapter, maybe even the foreword, where you said, I'd work today like no one else would, so I could live tomorrow like no one else could. So what that is, is what she just said. So she's taking, you know, it's going to take work. And it means I have to be disciplined, have habits and be focused, which can be all of those words, because some of the words you use people, I think hustle is one of those words too. people like beat up on the word hustle. And 
I feel like sometimes you're not even allowed to say as an entrepreneur, I'm hustling, I'm working hard, I'm doing the work, but I'm still happy. I'm tired, <laughs> but I really like what I do. And that's what we're talking about. So people are listening, like it isn't something like you're hustling for someone else. You're hustling for yourself. And I think that word and some of the words you use, people, it get they get a bad rap. Bold gets a bad rap every now and then, you know? So I think it's important for people to hear to dream big. You have to do this. Absolutely. And yes, and a lot of people have dreams, but to actually win, to actually accomplish your goals, you have to do this, as you say, and, and you're right, that that is the quote I always kept telling myself as I was going through it. I'm going to work today like no one else will, so I can live tomorrow like no one else can. And then I added live and give. Mm -hmm. I added and give to it because now what a wonderful opportunity I have to give back. I have time in a way that I didn't before, but I think that's so important. Another thing I tend to say is like focus, pocus, meaning if you really focus, if you're all in, it's like magic. It works if you really focus and don't give up. And the other very important point you just made, Lee, is you're right. It's not that it's all work. Uh, you know, there's a saying, it's only work if you'd rather be doing something else. It your heart is in it. And part of why I did it, and I didn't, you know, tell the story of why I left that financial job that I was only at for six weeks. Didn't love the industry, as I said, didn't love the culture. And I thought I can create my dream culture. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ever like the culture of this company, or I probably won't like the industry, but I know I love this translation industry. And I know we can create a dream culture. We can make it so sales and production are on the same team. We can make it so people are rewarded for their hard work, both emotionally and financially. Yeah. We can help change the world by connecting everyone. And it's, we can make it so we're working hard and playing hard and really love the other people we're working with and then it's worth being obsessed over yeah and it, and it, you don't feel bad giving it all that time yeah. you feel good because you're creating your dream yeah you kind of went warp speed through the bold framework so believe own learn design you were in that time period of like i believe this i own this i can do this i have my learnings i'm applying them i'm designing my life forward i'm creating it right design and create to me are, are synonymous. So I think what you're doing in, in that is you're actually setting the stage, but you're doing it at the pace and rate because you want to, you want to win. You know, I think that's one of the things you talk about in the book too, what, what that means. So what does winning mean to you in your life? Right. And, and that's a wonderful question because I think it changes as, as life goes on, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. I, I was always very competitive. I like to be the best, like a lot of us at whatever we're doing, whether it's winning an award in school, whether it's winning in sport. Uh, and for me, when I, when I started my company, it was about winning in business. But now, because I've had the time to step back and think, okay, what will my legacy be? What is really important? I think it's very important to have a um, great relationship with relationships with your family with your friends and then have a great purpose in life. That's important to you, whether it's your business, whether it's philanthropy and really feeling like you enjoy it and it's meaningful. It's helping people. And then finally, after all of that, if it wasn't part of the last part, the business part, giving back. So I think that's winning, but I think winning is a lot of, things to a, a lot of different things to a lot of people. And I think it changes as time goes on and that's okay. Yeah. It evolves. It evolves. Yeah. It can with being bold too. Like what I thought was bold in my thirties or forties is different in my fifties. And so I think your definition of a win also changes as you grow older, you get more information, you have more data, you know, what's worked or not worked. You have that growth mindset, right? Like on warp speed. Oh, oh absolutely. Because when, we started the company, my goal was, okay, if I'm going to start a translation company, I want to make it the biggest and the best. Mm -hmm. That was my thought. Because there were a lot of other competitors out there. And I thought, well, I don't want to just do what, what others are doing. There were 10,000 translation companies out there that we need to do it better. But then what I quickly learned was, it wasn't just about growing the company and feeling that we were doing that. It was also meeting great people, hiring these smart, motivated overachievers who came in right out of college, and then being involved in 
training them and developing them and retaining them and watching as they just wowed me. And then they were managing a hundred people and they were doing incredibly well in their careers and they were fulfilled. And it became much more about the people part of it. Not that I didn't enjoy the people early on, but when I was just out of grad school, I thought I need to be successful, but then you can really enjoy the meeting the other people and, and having some relationship with them and some role in whatever they're doing. And that can be just incredibly special and meaningful and that, that and being a win. Yeah. And it's not all about the money, even though your company did incredibly, incredibly well in, in a very short period of time. And you're the, you're a self-made billionaire. So from the perspective of what you've done with your business and where you are, but I love, we're not really talking about that. We're talking about the difference you can make, the things that you can do. And now the legacy that you will leave uh, because of the work that you've done and the hard work that you've done to get here. One of the things that you say in the book is it's imperative to foster an environment where your people are free to disagree. And sometimes that's a bold moment, right? I think being bold can be like when you do speak to power in a professional and respectful way, but you disagree. Some people, you know, like I think in my career, I've not always drank the Kool-Aid in organizations and don't always walk the line of, you know, saying what I'm supposed to say, which has gotten me in trouble every now and then. <laughs> but I always, I'm not doing it just to be a, a pain. I have an intention in that. Like mine has been like to speak for people who can't speak up or may, maybe we need to do better because we should be doing better. And ultimately leads, I think, to better results, higher quality, you know, organizations doing really well. But I think being free to disagree with an organization, how did that foster the work in TransPerfect and, and maybe even the work that you're doing now. Yes, absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. It's all about disagreeing. I mean, certainly the reason I started the company was I disagreed with how things were being. You're right. First, at the, original, at the original translation company, then at the financial institution I was at. So I thought the place could be better, better culture, better team orientation. But I agree with you all along the way. You need to continually reevaluate and think, how can we do things better? We, as a company, we became ISO certified, which is all about continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I noticed related to what you're saying is people fear change. People want the status quo. And it's the bold person, the risk taker, who, who says we need to change. And I remember we had a lot of challenges with that at our company, and not everyone wanted to do it. But when we did it, that produced the best results. So that's so important. And those are the type of people you want to hire people that are constantly looking at a situation and thinking, how can we do it better? How can we modify it? And then the last thing I'll say on all of that is I'm a huge believer on one-on-one -on -one meetings with your employees, uh, either your direct reports or people who report to people who report to you, because that's when you get the best ideas. Mm -hmm. And my favorite question to always ask them is, what would you do differently if you owned this company or ran this company? And people are often afraid to say those things and you might have to ask them a few times, but boy, when you do, you can get amazing ideas. I mean, some people will quickly tell you what they want done, but others may not. And, and getting those ideas, I mean, that's how you really can make the company a better place and the world a better place. And then one final quote that I love, it's a Mark Twain quote, I think he says something like when you find yourself kind of with the majority of people just going along with them, it's time to step away and reevaluate and rethink what you're doing. And I definitely feel that way because often people will just want to go along with it because it's easier mm -hmm. because they're following someone who is maybe a leader who doesn't want to change things. But really stepping back and thinking, how can this be better? I mean, those are the people that are really changing the world. And that's just so exciting yeah. to be a person who does that. Do you think you can dream big and win in your comfort zone? No, I don't. That's a great point. There's always risk and discomfort and scary to do the things you need to do to win after dreaming big, because yeah, you, you can sit back and think, well, I would love to create a, whatever, a billion dollar company. I would love to write a best-selling book. 
of the only way you're going to do those things is by taking risks and putting yourself out there and having some people that tell you not to, they don't agree with you. They say it's stupid or doing things that are hard for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that, that the discomfort comes along with the dreaming big and winning. It's, it, it has to be there. I mean, you won't get that opportunity to dream big and win without it. And so we all just have to embrace it and do it. And I'm doing it every day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing things that make me uncomfortable. Yeah. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. You are an example in action. <laughs> of what it takes. I think one of the things you talk about, which before we started taping, I was talking about the connection between ownership and agency and actually being able to see your dreams and how you can win. You you have to act. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you say is it's it's not about a mantra. I like mantras. I like inspirational sayings, but they're not going to move the needle, right? So tell us a little bit about action and how someone can say, okay, I have a dream, but I haven't taken action. So what do they do to go from the, I have it, but what do I need to do about it? Right. And that's, yes, that's the concept of doing eclipses, dreaming. Like we can dream all we want, but then we have to do. And yes, as we talked about, my book is all about verbs. Each each chapter is a verb or a form of verb saying what you need to do to get there. Yep. And another thing I tend to say is say it set it, do it, and then do it again. Meaning say what you're going to do, set your goal to make it happen, and then make sure you deliver on your goal. Mm -hmm. And then when you've accomplished your goal, whether it's a a certain amount of revenue in a month or in three months straight, you know, you, you accomplish it and then you do the whole thing again. So say it, set it, do it, and then do it again. And that is all about committing to it and discipline. You know, Mm -hmm. discipline is really the difference between the people who make it and the people who don't. I know Warren Buffett has a great quote that says that. I mean, and you know, who cannot, you know, aspire to be Warren Buffett. (laughs) But it is about discipline because that's what I've noticed. The people who are making it happen put a good amount of, you know, say it, said it, do it, discipline on themselves. They they stay with it every day for an extended period of time and it pays off. And so rewarding. Yeah. They keep the promises to themselves, right? So one of the things that I think happens that I see when I just know people have the opportunity, their ability is it's not about keeping your accountability to me, although I help people with that for sure, but it's to yourself. It's keeping your promises to yourself. If you say you're going to get up early, you get up early. If you say you're going to work out, you work out. If you say you're going to, you know, work extra this weekend to finish that book chapter, you do it. And so I'm just giving you some of mine, <laughs> yes, you know, right. like you have to keep the promises to you. Like uh, that's really, really important because Liz wasn't setting out from her dorm at NYU because she was trying to, to, to do things for someone else. Like you were doing it for you when you started, you wanted to make a difference. You wanted to see a change. You wanted to show that you could be successful and to do those types of things, which ultimately leads to a difference in this world. You have to take action and you have to keep those promises to yourself. So I think that's something that people should understand also that, you know, one of the things that comes through the book is one of your lessons was no one will value you if you don't value yourself. And in dreaming big and winning, you have to value that your dream is worthy, that you are valued and that you can spend the time, make the plan, think about, and it doesn't have to be overnight. It doesn't have to be in a year. It doesn't have to be in 30 seconds. I think there is this sense of urgency that success equals overnight. And I don't know about you, but uh, there's very few entrepreneurs that are overnight and, you know, three years can feel like 3 million years to an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's true. It's like entrepreneur years. You're yeah, right. exactly. Yes. It's like dog years or something. <laughs> yes. What do, What do you have to say about that? No one will value you if you don't value yourself. What do you want the listeners to hear in that? Right, right. And, and I think that's continuous. I felt that early on and I dealt with all kinds of things as I know many women have. I've been back at the proprietary trading division of the French bank. I was treated a certain way because I was a woman and I thought, well, I can't deal with this. This is not acceptable. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't enjoy the industry, so it made it easier. easier. To too. But yes, for sure. But at the same time, you know, I, I thought the only way I'm going to be treated this way is if I allow it to happen. So I've got to go build my own sandbox along the way. I also had issues being a woman. My partner was a man and people assumed that because he was the man, 
he was the boss, even though I was the one who had had experience in the industry. I had mm-hmm. studied four languages. I had worked in the industry for three years. He hadn't done those things, but people just, he did neither of those things. No languages, no experience in the industry, but because I was a woman needed to deal with that. And so I had to just kind of hold my head up high and say, this is how it works. It's about results. This is what we're going to do. And then I had some challenges at the end of my time when things weren't going so well. And so I had to pursue action. I had to ultimately litigate and change my situation. But no one was going to do it for me. No one cares about you and your success and your happiness nearly as much as you do. So we all have to stand up for ourselves. And I think that's such an important lesson. And I continually need to make sure I'm doing that and and make sure everyone around me is doing it because it's, it's critical. Yeah. It's an important piece of the puzzle for ongoing success. And I think ongoing impact that you can have in the world that you live in or whatever world that is. And and I think ultimately that's how we can continue to understand our own value is to understand, you know, what are we doing to move the needle each day? What promises are we keeping to ourselves? And when we think about your verbs, so your verbs in your book are beginning to dream, building the business, refining the purpose and reinventing. And so those words are very powerful words. So as you read the book, really think about how do I begin? How do I build? How do I refine? And how do I reinvent? And I want to say this because I think it's one of the, I would say the myths about boldness is it's too late to be bold. It's too late to dream big. It's too late to win. And I don't mean age. It could be like, oh, I've been in this, you know, I was in healthcare the majority of my career and I'm Obviously, I'm taking my learnings from that and doing it across industries now and across organizations and individuals, but I couldn't have made this up, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like what I'm doing today, right? So I think people understanding that it's never too late to dream big. What would you say to someone who might be thinking that right now? How would you guide them? Oh, I couldn't agree more. It's never too late to dream big. 50 is the new 30. I mean, we we are all trying to do things. I mean, here I am uh, at my old age with a brand new dream, which is to make the world a better place. At first I was trying to create my dream company and do it bigger and better than the competition. Now I see all the issues in the world, all the inequality, all the people who are not able to live long, healthy lives. And I am focusing on trying to make it, make the world better for all, Mm -hmm. make this world a better place for all. So I never think it's too late. And and the wonderful thing about this day and age is people now who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s are starting businesses, are starting foundations, are are changing the world in some big way, in a way that was never the case, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And that's so exciting. And we can do it better, actually, when we're older, because we've learned so much from all the things we did wrong. Mm -hmm. And we're still learning. I mean, it's a, a never ending process learning, but it's never too late and, and it's fun. But yes, I am such a believer in it's never too late. And we all know what we want more as we're older because we've learned what we don't want and what we want. And there couldn't be a better time to do it yeah. when we're older. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for being on the Bold Lounge. All the information about Liz, her foundation, her book, of course, and how to pick it up and pre order is below. Please check it out. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you for listening to the Bold Lounge podcast. Through the continuum of bold stories, vulnerability to taking a leap, you will meet more extraordinary people making a positive impact for others through their unique and important story. By highlighting these stories, we hope to inspire others and share the journey of those with a bold mindset. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and look forward to sharing the next bold journey with you.